Hey everybody, happy Valentine's Day. This is going to be our Valentine's Day show. This one's going to be very upsetting. Yeah. So, <laughs> so all of you hate it's, Valentine's yeah. Day, this is the show for you. Yeah, I know. I've been hearing about this case my whole adult life. This shit here, terrible. Well, terrible. two cases, and they're both equally terrible. I was thinking about the one from England first. They're both from England. Oh, they're both from England? Yeah. The one where they recorded that girl. Yeah. That's the one I was thinking of. Brady and Hindley. Yeah, Brady and Hindley. That's the name of them. We're also doing Fred and Rosemary West. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I know. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, re- now I realize who those. Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. you guys. Yeah. Well, the reason. Okay, so, like, the reason that I did this, if you guys remember, on our Valentine's Day special last year, we did Killer Couples. Yeah. And I think we did, like, four or five different ones. And that was, like, a super popular show. And it was, like, kind of fun to do in a kind of fucked up way. And I said, well, I've been wanting to do a show on either Fred and Rosemary West or Myra uh, Hindley and Ian Brady for like a really long time. And I said, well, let's do Killer Couples UK edition. Yeah, I thought today was and just going to be... And then we'll just talk about both of them. I thought today was just going to be Hindley and Brady. But I know the other one, too. That other one's bad. Yeah, it's yeah. Really bad. This is like some bad. I've seen a lot of stuff on that. Although Hindley and, Hindley and Brady, I read a book about them a long time ago. I did, ago. too. Um, yeah. yeah. And then I can remember uh, some programs that they played here here in the United States back in the early 80s and they actually played excerpts from those damn torture tapes that they were doing on that little girl yeah and I don't know how they got away with it back then they just people were hard more hardcore but man I heard those recordings and man that shit just bothered although me. they played those recordings in the courtroom and they said there wasn't like a dry eye in the house yeah and everyone was just bawling yeah they played were like you know on TV they only played like a few seconds in a few second yeah. snippets, you know what I mean? And that was all that, you know, but the it was thing, still, that's enough. It's like, I'm sure that I, I have to admit, I didn't look, I mean, I know kind of what the content of the tape is and I'm sure you could probably find it because it's the internet and it's the internet out there. is a terrible place. Yeah. Um, but I did not, I don't, you don't want to see that. I don't want to listen to that. You want to listen to that. I don't want to listen to that, but, uh, we're going to talk about them on the second half first half we're going to talk about fred and rosemary west yeah scumbags because like i said yeah yeah and i think i said this on our last valentine's day show too when we did killer couples before there is something very fascinating to me i mean yeah i'm fascinated by true crime in general but there's something very fascinating to me about couples that kill together because it's just such a weird like dynamic in the case of those two she was worse than he was in the West's case, it yeah. does seem like. According, I mean, according to surviving victims, they said they, they weren't really yeah. scared of him. They were scared of her. Although, generally, and I think this is true of uh, Brady and Hindley, too, is that the male halves of the couple committed crimes before they met their mm-hmm. soulmate, I guess, is a fucked up way of putting it. Yeah. Um, so there is some argument over whether, say, Myra Hindley or whether Rosemary West would have committed crimes on her own had she, you know, had they not met these successive men. They, because they did shit with, before they met. Yeah, I think, the the, I think the girls needed somebody to tell them it was all right to do it. That's and, kind and of what them. I feel. Like, I don't think they would have done it on their Probably own. Probably not, no. They needed but, somebody to, to fire them up and egg them on. Not saying that they yeah. weren't messed up people. No, Because clearly, up. they yeah. were. And like I said, in the case of Fred and Rosemary West, a lot of the escaped victims said that she was way worse than he was. Yeah. Um, in terms of just being like cruel, a, a yeah. cruel yeah. shitty. I mean, he was. She's probably too. trying to impress him, but she was into that shit too. She, even with her little boys and stuff. But we'll get to that. Yeah. So we'll it's just that. like a fucked up situation. Yeah. Yeah. But like I said, so if you hate Valentine's Day, then you've come to the right yeah, place. Yeah, we're fucking you over for Valentine's Day. <laughs> I actually kind of like Valentine's Day. It's like it's all yep. it's all red and pink. It's all yep. nice and everything like that. And this will be how how what number of Valentine's Day will this be know. for us? Eight. Will it be that much? Seven? Something like that, yeah. Seven or eight. No, yeah. I can't even remember. Yeah. I might have to get you a card. I know. <laughs> See, it's not Valentine's Day today. We're just 
recording this for Valentine's Day that is yet to come. Well, plus it's yeah, ooh, yeah. it's like ooh, it's like a last show on yeah. Nostradamus. We're telling yeah. the future. Yeah, this but, is the future. <laughs> but also the past. Yeah. I think this show is actually going to go up on the twelfth. So it will be a couple days before okay. Valentine's Day. All but right. so, uh, yeah, that's what we're going to do on this show. Um, other than that, we're just going to do like uh, regular little shout outs. Yeah, my book is out. Go buy yeah, it. Yeah, book's Go selling very it. well. Thank you very much. Uh, you guys will enjoy it. Uh, the audio book's just flying. Yeah. The audio book's flying. Both of them, actually. Yeah, it's doing that. Yeah. Um, and also check out our last movie review, which was yeah. Big Man Japan. Yeah, excellent movie. Yeah, Fun. You, guys, you guys really need to see that yeah. shit. <laughs> that shit's hilarious. All right, so like I said, we're going to talk about um, Brady and Hindley probably. I got to give a shout out, though. What do you do? Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay, so out. sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Th- those of you know that, you know, when I'm here doing the show, half the time I'm drinking and I drink, <laughs> I drink, a, I drink a drink that I've invented called Kugel Khan, okay? <laughs> because it's tequila. Of various types, you know. Uh, I'm Mostly it's silver tequila. Mixed with guava juice and pineapple. Well, I was getting it from this Welch's pre-made blend, but I had discovered something that's even better. I'm going to show it to you right here. <laughs> you even brought it yeah. into the office. Yeah, I brought it. It's these guys right here. Petite guava nectar. That's covered, but petite. Yeah. It's, from, it's from El Salvador. And it'll be like right along the Goya products stuff. Here in the United States, it's not expensive, about $1.50. This alone, with any t- any type of ca- tequila, to your preference, is, re- is good. You could, it could be one in one, two parts uh, juice, one part tequila. Or you could back it around, two parts tequila, one part juice. It's good. And you could, yeah. And to, with this, you can also, repro- uh, uh, you can also um, uh, reproduce or replicate my Welch's version of Kugel Khan, which is one part tequila. One part this, and one part uh, just pineapple juice, like Dole or Libby, whatever. And that's about that's about what Kugel Khan is supposed to taste like. If it's if it's too fruity for you, just bump up the tequila until you like it. But uh, yeah, keep your eye out for that. that yeah, and that wasn't like good. we didn't we got it at Publix. Got it at Publix. Um, I know you guys like if you're in the north of the United States or yeah. in the country, you don't know Publix is because it's a southern grocery chain. But I'm assuming that. Most regular grocery stores have yeah. it. Public ha- Publix has it. Probably most yeah. other places have it too. So. Yeah, Goya probably sells a similar version too. You know, they do is, actually, and I think it's even called the same price, thing. The like same the packaging thing. looks yeah. uh, very similar. You might be able to get that in Europe. I know that they, there's a British guy asking me, you know, how to make that, and that's you know, yeah. so it came to mind when I saw that. Yeah, I'm that not some sure. people don't know much about guava. In in, in yeah. Brazil, we call it guayaba. Yeah. And it said goyaba on there, too. So I guess it's the same in Spanish, goyaba. Yeah, that's what yeah. I'm imagining. It's a good fruit. Yeah. So uh, so if you ever want to know how to make kugel, yep. like I said, when I make the shirt, I'll make the little... It's just, like I said, one, one, one. It can one. go it's, with it's silver easy. tequila, reposado, and also um, gold. Mm-hmm. It'll go, it goes with them all. Now, it may vary to certain brands. I really like that... Um, um, uh, what, what do you call it? Hornitos Reposado yeah. is really good with that juice. Although you could probably put Cuervo Gold and uh, Margaritaville Gold, you know. Uh, but I think if you if you don't want that tequila flavor, if you want it to be more mild, kind of like a vodka type drink, go with the silver. Silver tequila blends with it well too. Because I was going to say, we might have mentioned this on the show before, but we get a lot of our liquor, well, we get most of our liquor at Sam's. Yeah. Because that shit is cheap as shit, yo. Cheap as shit, yeah. It's, it's like, I get this big, big, huge, huge bottle of vodka and it's like $14. $14. And when you taste it, they're like, that's Grey Goose. Yeah. It's either it Grey Goose like, or, or Sky. Yeah. It's the same it tastes pretty much just like Same Goose just vodka. like it. And he gets the uh, the members marks that that's Sam's yeah. brand. Big old thing, a damn hundred percent agave yeah. silver tequila, and I really can't tell it apart from Cuervo. And silver. how much? That's only twenty. Twenty bucks. 20, twenty, 20 bucks. It's ten dollars like cheaper than uh, than Cuervo silver. Yeah. The but yeah, they're they're brand. Man, like I can't I said, tell them apart. They have regular brands too, but yeah. we usually just get their store brands because they're good, except for the whiskey. Uh, yeah, we, and it's not good. We have got their store brand whiskey, and that was really not good. In fact, it's still in there. And for liquor to last that long in our house, you know yeah. it's not good because they it's try like, to, I haven't got desperate enough to drink it yet. They try to sell you a, a scotch, but it's a, you know, it's a scotch whiskey, but um, it's blended. And you know that you know Scott's supposed to be single malt. 
And you can taste kind of an artificial wood flavor to it. It tastes, it tastes like licking smoky. the bottom of yeah, our grill. Not good. not good. That's the first time I drank it. Yeah. I was like, this is like I stuck my face like in our grill that we haven't cleaned yeah. for several months. Although I've noticed it. that uh, Johnny Walker red and red label and black label are not as good as they were 20 years ago. Yeah. Probably they're no. blended them, like I said. I think they're making more of it, and I think it's a blended whiskey now. Yeah. Everything's getting cheap. Still, Glenn guys. Fittick is still real good. Yeah, that's your favorite. Yeah. <laughs> we got to get on to the show, though. Yeah, we're talking yeah, too yeah. much about booze. That's okay. That's a, it's a Valentine's special. Yeah, it's a Valentine's special. Everybody get drunk for Valentine's yeah, Day. Yeah, I know, mostly I know that's like, us anyway. I know that's like not a thing. That's that's more a St. Patrick's Day thing, I guess. All right, so first let's talk about Fred and Rosemary West. Yeah. Now, there's yeah. several um, documentaries about these two. There's one called House of Horrors, which is actually quite good, uh, kind of going around. But these two motherfuckers are... When Again, you see him, it explain everything is exp- explains to you. You know, you, everything yeah. is explained when you look at him. Look, and Fred West kind of reminds me of Son of Sam, a little bit an older version of Son of Sam. Yeah, he looked a lot like that. Same kind of kind of fucked up hair and that same fucked. Do up you want to hear something weird? It's like every time I saw him. Do you know who? You're, I don't know if you know who this is, but he reminded me of um, Mac Davis. Maybe it was either. the hair, like the yeah. singer from the '70s that had kind of that. Okay. Kind yeah. of, it was kind of like a white boy afro, yeah. sort of. Or yeah. Brillo pad type action yeah. he had going. Weird. It's just he just looks like a dumpy. Yeah, they're trashy, dumpy looking people. Kind of. Yeah. yeah, and you know, as we get into this family dynamic, I mean, this is some fucked up shit. And the times had a lot to do with it too. This, the True. styles that they wore were super seventies ish. Yeah, because they were seven. They didn't really get caught uh, for the murders until the nineties. Yeah, but they've been doing it for. Many yeah, and years. a lot of the pictures you see them in are kind of dated clothing. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. Like I said, they were very, like, frumpy and mm-hmm. weird looking. It's never, it's it's funny because we always say, like, people, it, it especially back in the 80s, like, people that looked like goths and stuff and people yeah. that looked like punk rockers, they'd be like, oh, they're, they're terrible people and stuff. I'm like, no, it's, no that's all bit... the normal looking people yeah. that are, like, you gotta watch. Yeah. People that look like us, it's like, all of our weird shit's on the outside. There is yeah. no weird shit inside. We you knew a girl, I mean? if you looked at her, just looked yuppie as hell. Yuppie as hell. Totally normal. Totally real, normal. Real, 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 you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, I do. That chick was giving hand jobs and, and, and turning tricks and shit on the sly. Nobody knew. Uh, anyway, right. that, yeah. I mean, the, I, I mean like, us, damn. it's like people probably think all kind of freaky shit about us. Yeah. Like, maybe not nowadays, no. but it's like we're like this boring as fuck seriously. Yeah. No, I mean, like you, you <laughs> never would have known. You never would have known. Yeah. You never would have known. And, and she, I, that's the case. Running me. ads and running ads in the newspaper and hiring bodyguards to go work through, out of the hotels. Be, it, why? Because she needed the money. It's just that yeah. simple. Just needed the money. Just got to watch. Like Weird, said, Watch man. those normal looking people. Yeah. All right. So these two, this actually happened in the West Midlands. And uh, these two are classed as serial rapists and serial killers because they did both uh, rape and kill people. Um, that they know of. And so, you know, did torture, all that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Fred West first, like before, because like I said, he had committed some shit before he even met her. Um, so he's actually from a town called Much Markle, which I, yeah. I love British town names, you guys. It's like, I used to live over there for a while. And it's like, I just love, there's just this funny fucking town names they have. Now, according to some accounts, like other family members, according to some of Fred's accounts, the family that he came from was pretty fucked up. Uh, Evidently, his dad was uh, engaging in incest with the sisters, uh, and that was like something that you did. You broke in the daughters. That was something that dads did, I guess. That's what they uh, said. At least according to them. Yeah. Uh, Fred also allegedly was introduced to bestiality by his dad. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure how true that is, but that right. is, uh, you know, one rumor that is What did uh, he accuse him of? Accuse of what? Like, what kind of bestiality? What are you talking about? I don't know. They fucking didn't, sheep. No, fucking fucking sheep? I don't know. Okay. It just said bestiality. Okay. Use your imagination. Well, you know, yeah. <laughs> I was um, using my imagination. I was trying to imagine... <laughs> You know, I was trying to use what, my what imagination, exactly but happened? I can't imagine it if okay. you don't tell me specifically okay. what species we're yeah. talking about. Right. I was talking like, what now? Who? I you would know. imagine in that part of the country, it's probably sheep. Okay. And, you know. Yeah. Hey, son, I, go down and knock down that sheep. Out there. <laughs> Here's how you do shit. it. 
Yeah, when you, you see these, <laughs> you saw him, it all it all make a lot more sense. But okay, go ahead. He def- he definitely does look like he a looks sheep like fucker. somebody. That. He looks like a sheep fucker. Yeah. <laughs> um, there are also allegations that Fred's mom was also molesting him. Was molesting Fred. He had a bunch of siblings. I think yeah. there were six of them. So, uh, you know, so I don't know, but there was there was that whole fucked up shit. Now. Although there was all this sexual abuse apparently going on, um, Fred and his mother were evidently had a very close relationship. Like he was, um, he was kind of a dummy and, uh, he had, he had like a pretty low IQ. Um, he was functionally illiterate. Um, but he, so he would go to school and he wasn't very good. He was a good artist and he could do like woodworking type stuff, like hands, stuff with his hands, but, um, he couldn't really read and he was kind of dumb in other ways. Um, so whenever he would get in trouble at school, like his big, and his mom was like super obese. Um, and she would like come down to the school and like yell at the teachers for like, Damn. for, um, you know, messing with her little kid or whatever. What so, were they doing? I, well, I guess when he got bad grades and okay. stuff like that, she was right. one of those yeah. kind of moms, like right. back in the day, like she was supposedly like really protective of him and she would come like thundering into the school and like yell at right, his teachers yeah. and stuff. So, um... He only stayed in school till he was 15, and like I said, when he left, he could barely read. Uh, he went off to be a farm laborer. Um, also, kind of not a ba- not a great looking kid, uh, but he did kind of get a little bit better looking later on when he was a teenager. Now, when he was 17 years old, he bought a motorcycle and almost immediately got into an accident. Um, crushed his skull, broke his arm, I th- or, uh, and broke one of his legs. I think one of his legs was uh, shorter than the other, like pretty mm-hmm. much his entire life. Uh, I think after the motorcycle accident, he was in a coma for about a week, mm. uh, and he had to have a metal plate in his head and stuff like that. And they said that his behavior kind of changed after well, of that. of course, yeah. Yeah, like he started having yeah. like rage issues and things of that nature. Well, you got to really crush in a skull pretty bad. They put a plate in your head. Yeah. So that's... Yeah, that was a serious head injury. Yeah. yeah. And it should be noted, too, that two years later... He got another head injury. Ah, multiple head injuries. Allegedly, yeah. when he was at a nightclub, and he was um, real grabby with oh, the girls. Yeah. Uh, he would go to club because he thought that's just what you did. Well, doesn't everybody do that? Yeah. He just goes up and grabs their tits or like sticks their his hand up their skirts and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, he was in a nightclub, and he was out on a fire escape with this girl, and he stuck his hand up her skirt. And she punched him and, like, knocked him down the fire escape. So he fell off the fire escape <laughs> and fell on his head. I was like, hey, good for yeah. her. Um, and busted up his head again. So that was another head injury. So we're right. talking about a family in which uh, rape, incest, stuff like that was seen as no big deal. Uh, and also two major head injuries. Right. Um, also, like I said, he wasn't the brightest bulb. Uh, to start with. So this is a natural disaster just waiting to happen. Yes. Or happening, actually. It, it is happening, and it right, did right. happen, sadly enough. Right. So, um, and when he was uh, about 19 years old, he actually had his first conviction that I know of, and that was for molesting a 13-year-old girl. Um, he actually got off with that for medical issues because the doctor said, oh, he had all these head injuries, and he has epileptic fits now. So he actually kind of got away with it, although his family kind of disowned him, even though I feel like they probably weren't much better. Right. Um, He actually got a manual job doing construction, but then got fired because he, for stealing. So like I said, he was a criminal pretty much from the get go, like from, from being a teenager, even before Mm. uh, he met his wife. Um, So he goes back to um, his family. Finally were like, okay, you can come back now. So he comes back when he's about 21. He get, he hooks up with this woman named Catherine Costello, who's called Rena. Rena. Now, he did marry her. Uh, she was allegedly a prostitute. She had been a petty thief and a prostitute. They had dated before and then had broken up and whatnot. Um, but they got married later on. Now, when they got married, she was already pregnant with another man's child. And this man was uh, Pakistani. And what happened was, when the baby was born... They would explain, well, because uh, Rena was got in trouble with her family because of the mixed race baby. So they told her parents that the baby that she was pregnant with died and that this one they had now was adopted. So okay. because she looked half Asian or whatever. It's okay. like, you know what I mean? 
So that was kind of fucked up. The little girl's name was Charmaine. That's what they named her. Now, they, at this point... And they bought that story? I guess. They bought that story? I don't know. I don't know, uh, like, how... They didn't live in the same town, so okay. I guess they just kind of like, yeah, that's whatever. Whatever. So, yeah. Now, at this stage, they moved to Scotland, and Rena started getting... Um, disillusioned with the marriage because of Fred's weird like sexual proclivities he was very sexually aggressive he really liked um you know sadomasochism he was all into that kind of stuff and she just kind of wasn't having it um however they did have a child of their own at one point uh named Anne Marie or Anna Marie and Fred got a job as an ice cream truck driver um, allegedly this kind of allowed him to go and molest kids willy-nilly uh mm. you know so there was that whole thing going on. Now, he did that for a while until he accidentally ran over a four-year-old kid with his ice cream truck. Damn. Now, I think the kid died. Now, it was an accident. Like, right. a judge ruled that it wasn't his fault. Right. But he still couldn't be an ice cream truck driver in right. that town anymore because everyone said, hey, you're the guy that ran over that kid. That's not cool. So then they had to move away. So at this point, it's him, the kid the wife, and then a friend of the wife, whose name was Anna McFall, and they had a nanny whose name was Isa McNeil. And so all of them moved to Gloucestershire. Now, at this point, uh, the wife, Rena, she's like, fuck this shit, and she left, but she left the kids with him and the friend. So they're all, like, living together in this caravan, or, like, we would say a trailer, but over there they say a caravan. So then he starts fucking the friend, Anna McFall. Anna McFall gets pregnant with his kid. This dude had so many fucking kids. Yeah, you no, don't even yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. You don't even know. He had so many kids. Yeah, kids with everything. Yeah, it's like yeah. If, if it moved, he would have a kid with it. Yeah. He would impregnate it. You boy, know what, what I mean? Some, that, boy, that's a reproductive strategy from hell, isn't it? Yeah. He's getting away with it. Spreading God. his seed. <laughs> His I feel twisted, so twisted dark. Scene. I know. I feel so bad yeah. because it's like I've seen pictures of um, you know his remaining surviving children that are yeah. grown up now and stuff like that, and it's like God, I would hate to be them. They've had their names changed, right? Like yeah. That. But um, yeah. So he gets Anna McFall pregnant, and then because she was kind of like, well, why don't you divorce the first life wife and marry me and blah blah blah, and he said not, nah, and he killed her. Damn. So he killed her, dismembered her, buried her. I think she was eight months pregnant at the time. Uh, so, like I said, nobody knew about this until much later on, uh, but they know that that's probably what happened at that What did he do point. with the body, did he ever say? Um, he usually, generally what he would do is he would cut them up and, like, bury them in the yard, and then he would, like, put paving stones over them, or he would, right. like, you know, bury them under paving stones, or then, like, build things over them, like right. wells or okay. whatever. Um, so he did that kind of shit. And she was never reported missing, evidently. Yeah, no one reported her missing okay. uh, at the time. And like I said, they didn't even know about her being dead until much later. Mm. So um, the first, like, person that he wasn't, uh, you know, that he wasn't known to, that, that wasn't part of his family, in other mm. words, that they think that he might have killed was a 15-year-old girl named Mary Bastholm. And she actually disappeared from a bus stop. And she was reported missing, obviously, uh, and they never found her, but they're suspecting that that was something that he did also. Um, so at this point, he's kind of like, uh, you know, still stealing and he fenced stuff from his job and everything like that. Then he gets a job as a bakery truck driver. And this is where he meets Rosemary, whose name was Rosemary Letts at the time. Now, she was quite a bit younger than him um but i think i believe she was only 15 uh when he saw her at a bus stop or whatever and they kind of started up a relationship she also had quite a fucked up childhood um her dad was a paranoid schizophrenic uh and what a severe disciplinarian uh her mother daisy had actually uh had depression and they did electroshock therapy on her while she was pregnant with Rosemary, hmm. uh, which they think may have contributed also. Uh, Rosemary was also allegedly sexually abused by her father. Um, and she was one of these kids. She, um, 
she was also not extremely intelligent. Uh, she was a little chubby when she was a kid, so she got teased a lot. But she was very aggressive. Like, her dad always kind of told her, like, oh, you need to stand up for yourself. Because, I mean, he used to beat on her and he used to right. beat on the wife and everything. You need to stand up for yourself. Don't let anybody pick on you. So when she was in school and somebody would pick on her, she would knock them the fuck out. You right. know what I mean? So she was... um you know, not like a shy retiring girl even back then, even though, like I said, she came from a very uh, fucked up uh, family situation. And because she was kind of heavy um, and because of her aggressive nature, she, um, boys her age didn't really like her. So she became very promiscuous and started sleeping with a lot of uh, older men. So there was that whole shit going on too. Um, and she was also raped by someone else later on. Um, finally, her mother couldn't take it anymore and took Rosemary and took, and they went and lived with, uh, I believe it was, uh, Rosemary's sister who was older and married. So they went off on that. Now, when they, when Rosemary met Fred West, here's... Cat's moving the camera. Yeah, she's moving the camera again. She's, <laughs> she's our little kitty camera person. Yeah, why are you moving the camera? Your little camera kitty. Don't move it. She's like, but I want to move it. Yeah. Yeah, she's moving the camera. Come here. Yeah. Okay. You got to get her. She's like, but no, I want to. She's like, no. <laughs> nope, she's I want to eat over it. the camera. Okay. All right. Now, ironically, when Fred and Rosemary started dating, Rosemary's dad did not approve of Fred and was like, I'm, you know, I'm disown you if you don't stop seeing him and stuff like that. Even though he had been beating on her and raping her and stuff all the yeah. But somehow this was a step too far. I don't know. Maybe um, he liked the competition. Uh, that's, that's kind of actually yeah. what I was thinking of. So during this time period, um, Rosemary got pregnant. They had a daughter named Heather. Um, Fred was kind of in and out of jail for like petty shit. Um, you know, it was mostly like theft and not paying fines for previous crap and everything like that. Now, while he was in jail, like he was in jail for like nine months one year, Charmaine, who was the daughter uh, from Fred's first wife, you know what I mean? She had been... When he had killed. When he killed. No. When he killed that one? That was, okay, that was the no, girlfriend that he No, that killed. was the girlfriend. Right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you, this, you're going to lose track because yeah, they killed so, so many, many fucking them, people. Right no, this was Charmaine, the little girl that... When he married uh, Rena Costello, she had already been pregnant okay. with the Pakistani man's baby. Okay, yeah. This was that kid. That kid, right. Um, that they that Fred and Rena were raising as their own kid and were saying that it, it was, was adopted, adopted and right. blah, blah, blah. Now, while Fred was in jail, um, Charmaine was like living with Rosemary, staying with Rosemary, and they're pretty sure that Rosemary killed that little girl. Damn. While he was in prison. Now, this this was one of the things because, you know, when they later got arrested, Fred was, like, trying to protect her the whole time. She didn't know and, you know, she didn't do anything and, you know, leave her alone and stuff like that. And for a long time, they were like, well, they didn't have any solid evidence that she had actually killed anyone. Although they did think that she had participated in the sexual abuse. How but, old was that little girl when they killed her? Um, I'm actually not really sure. She was yeah. pretty. She was pretty young. Okay, so still, still four or five, six. Right? Um, so. yeah. Well, I'm not gonna say because I'm not okay. entirely sure. But um, okay. But yeah. But when they later on, when they found, uh, you know, did when they did um, analysis of the skull and her teeth and stuff like that, so they could determine if she was killed in the time period when Fred was in jail. Then they assumed that Rosemary had done it. So oh, they found the body. Yeah, they, was she it? was one of the ones that was found, but that was later. Like I said. Okay. So. Um, all right. So Fred and Rosemary got married uh, in January of 1972. Now, pretty much as soon as they got married, Fred's like, "Well, you need to work as a prostitute. I'm going to set up a little uh, room for you, and you can have clients, and yeah. it'll be extra money, and I can watch." Yeah, that's and she thing. seemed to be like totally fine with this situation. So um, he would also take like naked photographs of her and send them into swinger magazines, like for ads. So people were coming over to the house, and actually, in one of the I don't remember if it was House of Horrors, but it was or if it was one of the other documentaries. But they actually found some of the videos that he had had that he had made of her with like some of the other clients, like coming into the house 
And I'm just like, this is the skeeviest shit yeah. I've ever. It's like, oh yeah. my god, it's like so fucking nasty. But there was so there was all that kind of shit going on, and um, so the more kids they're having, uh, you know, because they had another daughter then named May, uh, in 1972, and then they decide, well, we need a bigger house, so they move to the very famous 25 Cromwell Street. Um, which was the address that where they were caught, and that's kind of where uh, most people, that's the address that most people associate with them. Now, they had um, a couple of renters that lived upstairs, uh, you know, so they, for extra money and stuff, but they, they put, like, a stove and shit upstairs so no one would come down and, like, disturb them because they have all this stuff going on. So Fred made a very special room for Rosemary that had peepholes all in it and cameras it also had a little red light, helpfully, on the outside so that when she was in there entertaining, yeah, n- n- you know, none of the kids would go in there because mommy's working. Damn. So, yeah, there was that whole thing. Um, as the years went on, she had seven more children, three of which were fathered by Fred. Uh, the other ones were fathered by various clients. Um, so, yeah, they, uh, they were all mixed race, all different uh, races and whatnot. So there was that whole thing going on. Now, later that year, in about October of 1972, Fred and Rosemary hired a nanny, uh, Caroline Owens. Now, they just kind of found her, like, at a bus stop or walk or hitchhiking or whatever the hell she was doing, and said, hey, um, you know, do you need a job? We need somebody to look after all these fucking children that we have. And she was like, okay, because she needed money. Now... When she started working there and she started living there with them, both of them started making sexual advances toward her, to which she was like, no, thank you. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, but so so after that, she kept refusing them. But then actually, uh, at one point, they got frustrated with her and they like knocked her out and tied her up. And... So, and they, I think they might've drugged her too. And then they were like threatening her. Like, we're going to let all our friends come over and fuck you and yeah. all this other kind of shit. And then, um, then he said, then I'll kill you and I'll bury you under the patio or whatever. So she just kind of went along with it. Now they did let her go. Um, and she's actually, there's an interview with her on the, on one of the documentaries and it's like pretty frightening yeah. like she was the one that said that she was worse than him yeah she was, was one her. of the ones that said that because yeah. like i said every now and then they would let somebody go but this she was like the most famous case yeah. now she, they did let her go um and she went to the police but when the police investigated fred was able to convince them that it had all been consensual so all he was given was a fine yeah with like 50 pounds damn so that's nice. Yeah, I don't know how that happened. Yeah. So yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, why, well, it was his word and her word against the girl, so they were able to overpower. Her, I guess, that's or, yeah, because you know, they just said, w- would her anybody a liar. really believe like how fucked up? Like yeah. especially if it was just a man, Sounds they might have believed all it. Outlandish. Yeah. But a man and his wife like yeah. doing that shit to you because right. she said both of them raped her. Right. You know, and she said that she was. The woman, the uh, cops Rosemary didn't buy it. They thought it was too outlandish. That's what I mean. They thought it was too weird, and they're like, "Yeah, that doesn't happen." But it did. Yeah. yeah. So now, over the subsequent six years, uh, it is thought that they murdered at least eight other young women. Usually, uh, same type of thing where they would find somebody at a bus stop, or they would find somebody hitchhiking. They would pick them up and go, "Hey, we need somebody as a nanny, like a live-in nanny for all our kids." Um, bring them back to the house, proceed to put them down in the basement, tie them up, torture them, uh, you know, sexually assault them. Um, and it got worse and worse. Like as a time, yeah. like they did worse and worse shit to them. Yeah. He had like a torture chamber set up. Pretty I, I much. I remember an interview with the son. The son said when he was a little kid, he walked down to the basement and interrupted his dad torturing one of those girls. Yeah. And he can kind of remember it. Yeah. And he just said, he said, he said, turn around and go back upstairs, you didn't see anything type of deal. Yeah. And I was under the impression, based upon what the son had said, is that he was skinning her alive. That he had her hanging up from the ceiling with skinning her alive. That's, that's, I remember yeah, that was that the impression Yeah, that may not, I because had. like I said, by the time they found the bodies, he had pulled most her of fingernails were, out. One of the he, well, well, one thing that he would do was he would take the fingers off, like at the joint. Okay. 
that was like one of his signature taking the fingers mutilations. off mutilations okay yeah for whatever what was reason. he doing it with pliers or something i yeah i guess and i'm not sure why he did it i don't know why uh, like because he thought that they wouldn't be able to identify the fingerprints or hmm. or if that was just like his thing he like was he was into fingers alive? i don't know okay but, uh, yeah, so there was a lot of the bodies that they found. It's been a long on. time since I've heard his testimony. Yeah. I was under the impression that he had that he had skinned her alive and something to do with her fingers, like you said. Yeah. Cut her fingers off or something. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, so the ones that, um, that kind of uh, went missing were murdered during this time period. Uh, one was named Linda Goff. Uh, she was actually uh, a friend of theirs. She was like a seamstress or something like that. So they ended up killing her. Uh, the next one was Carol Ann Cooper. She was just walking home from a movie theater one night and they lured her into the car or, you know, stuffed her into the car or whatever. Um, there was another woman named Lucy Partington, uh, also disappeared from a bus stop while on her way home from Christmas. Uh, they actually held her captive for a week before killing her. Um, so then there were between 1974 and 1979, uh, five more victims. Uh, these were Teresa Siegenthaler, Shirley Hubbard, Juanita Mott, Shirley Ann Robinson, and Allison Chambers. Um, so th those are the ones that they know of. The they're assuming that there are probably more. These are most of the ones whose bodies were later found. Um... Boy, she's tearing it up. Becky. Yeah, what are you doing? What are you doing, Kitty? She's tearing up. She's so uh, noisy. Tearing up boxes. Okay. Yeah. So, not only was all this horrific shit going on, but Fred was also sexually abusing one of his daughters, Anna Marie, um, who was one of his daughters with Rena, I think. Yeah. Um, she actually got pregnant with his child. But it, this, she ended up losing it because it was ectopic, so they had to do an abortion. Um, now, she took off. She went and lived with her. She ran away from home and went and moved in with her boyfriend. Now, after that happened, Fred started abusing the other daughter, Heather. Um, now, this, there are some, uh, they're not sure of the paternity of Heather. They're not sure if this was Fred and Rosemary's daughter or, because this is fucked up too. Check this shit out. Remember how Rosemary's dad was like so dead set against you not going out with Fred and stuff like that? Well, a couple years later on, like after they got married and they'd been living together and she was working as a prostitute out of this house, her dad would come over and have sex with her Damn. and like pay and Fred Damn. would watch. Ooh, weird. So there is some speculation that Heather was actually the product of Rosemary and her dad. Weird. You know what I mean? And so I'm not really sure. They, but they say, think that you might say this is like a family of wild animals, but not even wild animals. Did that's this what I mean. It's like not even it's animals like, are that bad. This Come is, on. Animals are a lot more noble, actually. Uh, th th this is like uh, demons. Yeah. It's like a family of demons. Yeah. It's horrible. Yeah. yeah. So Fred is like abusing Heather. He's also abusing the daughter May. Um, and what he would do, it's. Like I said, he would bury them in the yard and he pretended like he was doing home improvements all the time. Like, oh, I'm going to build this nice well or I'm going to build this yeah. nice patio and stuff. But he was putting fucking bodies under there. Only right. nobody knew until later on. Um, so in 1986, um, they actually almost got caught because what ended up happening was that Heather was at school and told some of her school friends kind of what was going on in the house or like the abuse that she was going through. And one of her friend's parents called the cops. So after that happened, Fred and Rosemary killed Heather. Yeah. And put her under the under, patio. Yeah, under patio stairs, I think. And then later on, they would threaten the other kids with, if, hey, if you ever tell anybody what we did, we're going to put you under the patio like Heather. Yeah. They, they would tell knew. them, yeah, they would tell them that kind of shit. Yeah. Like, I don't think any of them saw it happen, but a bunch of them said that, that they would say that to them all the time. So... So this has been going on since the fucking 1970s. Now, they didn't get caught until 1992. In 1992, Fred made a videotape of himself raping one of his daughters. Yeah. She told her friends about it. The friend's parents reported the West to the police. Um, yeah, what was funny is that the younger children, the daughters actually, I've seen interviews with them, they're quite normal. They knew that all this shit was weird. 
Yeah. They're, they, you know, it was, it was, Most they're, kids do know. Yeah, it's like, that that's why. Weird, and they, they were trying to get the hell out of there. And yeah. They knew, that these kids, they knew that these parents were evil. Were fucked up. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you would know that because like I said, this is an abnormal. <laughs> yeah. Even if you were raised in that situation, you know, that's not right. You know, that's not right. Yeah. Well, they had friends who lived normal lives. They knew that all right. the, and I guess the older ones would tell the younger ones, this ain't right. Yeah. These people are crazy. Yeah. So at this stage, the cops mm-hmm. finally go, and there was one investigating um, officer. Her name was Hazel Savage, and she's like, oh, I remember this Fred West guy because she was remembering some shit that happened with his first wife, Rena Costello. And she's like, whatever happened to that woman? It's like, you know, no one's heard from her or anything like that, so they wonder where she was. So um, another girl later came forward and said that Fred had raped her as well. So at this point, the police were able to get a search warrant um, and they started searching the house. At this point, they were just looking for evidence of child abuse. Um, so they start, uh, you know, searching the house and the grounds. Um, Fred got arrested for rape and sodomy of a minor. Uh, Rose also got arrested as his accomplice. Um, so while they were going through the system, all their children were taken away, thankfully, and, uh, you know, put in care. Yeah. So... At this, so Fred is in jail. Rosemary attempts suicide. Unfortunately, her son saves her because actually she's still alive, I think. Yeah. yeah, she's still alive to this day. Fred's not. Um, but the, so while they, before they were put on trial, like the victims that were going to testify against them backed out. I mean, they were just little. They were just like 13 years old. She's tearing up your work. That's, it's okay. People, I don't, people I don't, you should see what the hell's going on back here behind, she's this behind the laptop. She's like, what? And then she looks up at us like, yeah. I don't understand why you're like yelling yeah. at me. I'm just playing with the paper. She loves she, to play with paper. She loves paper. She loves yeah. to eat it. So I'm just kind of letting her do it because if I take it away, she'll just like start. Yeah, she'll make a bunch of noise out there. She'll make know. a I'll bunch of noise. I'll get closed doors and everything. <laughs> she makes a lot of noise. Yeah. She's not like a cat. She's more like a monkey. Yeah, Very like a monkey like a... and a puppy. Yeah. All in one, like in a little cat form. Yeah. But yeah, she's, so if that's what that noise is. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, so... so so the victims like didn't want to testify like i said they were only like kids they were just like 13 or something like that so they got scared and they backed out um however one of the investigating officers officers was still kind of like you know there's just too much sketchy shit going around in this family and like there's all these people that are kind of missing and we don't know where they went to so she kind of kept pursuing them and then they start interviewing the other children uh and this is when the kids started saying hey they kept you know, saying that they're going to bury us under the patio, like Heather, blah, blah, blah. So at this point they said, okay, we need to dig up this whole fucking yard. So they dig up, uh, the patio and they find at first they find two sets of human remains. So they know one of them is probably Heather. Um, they also found the bodies of Anne McFall, uh, you know, what did the woman that he was having sex with earlier before he met Rosemary and Charmaine, uh, the little the girl baby, that baby. the uh, that Rosemary probably killed. Uh, so they found all of those bodies. Um, at, and at this point, uh, you know, they, they just kept turning up more and more human bones. I think at that particular house, I think they found nine sets of remains and then went back to the house that he had lived in before and found, I think, three more Damn. sets of remains. Uh, so he's been doing this for quite a long time. And nobody fessed up for a little Charmaine. Well, see, when Fred West was taken into custody, he finally confessed to the murders. He was trying to protect Rosemary, I think. Right. But later on, when they examined Charmaine and were trying to determine, like, they were trying to close in, like, on a, you know, on a death on date. A death date yeah. So they could see if it had happened when he was in jail. And they determined that it was very, very likely that she was killed while he was in jail, which means that it was probably Rosemary did it. Hmm. Because that's who she was staying with. was just to get rid of the burden? Financial burden? Yeah. Right. I mean, neither of these assholes gave a single shit. Right, yeah. About anyone. Anybody, yeah. And it just seemed like they were... They kept having kids, hearing, but they were... I remember seeing, like, little interviews uh, with uh, Fred. And um, I don't think he had a real concept of what rape was anyway. I think he thought just sex was like that. You're he supposed, did. You're he just, did say almost exactly that. Did he? Okay, yeah. When they asked him, yeah, because I've heard him talking and stuff like that. I think the way he was brought up and he was, you know, his brain was kind of messed up and everything like that. When 
people, you know, when he was asked about rape, he said, well, doesn't everyone do that? Right, yeah. That's what I so I don't think he had any but, Yeah, concept. sex was something that you jumped on somebody because you liked them. They fought you and then you just overpowered them. And, and that's just anyway. how that's it worked. That's it was, right, yeah. Like, I, I, I was do under that think impression. that he thought that. Yeah, I was under the impression because that was, that was how he learned how to do it through, in his family. Yeah. Like that's how it went down in his family, and that's I think he thought that's just... That was his version of the birds and the bees. Yeah, and it's, yeah. it's instructive, too, that even though he eventually did confess to the murders, he would not confess to raping anyone because he said, no, all these people wanted to have sex right, with me. Right, yeah. So he had some uh, issues with consent, right, I guess. Because, yeah. um, like, a, he, would, he would not... He, he would confess to murder, well, if he but consent, not rape. If he wanted it, then there was consent. Right. That just means because it doesn't matter if she wanted it or not. That's just how it goes. Sorry. Sorry, ladies. That's yeah. just the way it works. Yeah, he was consented. Yeah. Yeah. But he actually did end up, like I said, he, he insisted forever that Rosemary did not have anything to do with it, blah, blah, blah. Now, weirdly, like Rosemary, uh, as soon as he got arrested and he was like trying to... Uh, you know, take her hand at the inquest or whatever. And she blew him off and that fucked him up like a lot. And he actually, he was on suicide watch uh, for the, for a little while, but then they kind of, it went a little lax later on and he uh, hung himself. Yeah. And he actually left a fucking note. Listen to this shit. I had, he wasn't I had in there for very long. No, he didn't yeah. even... I don't even think he was, like, convicted even. He was a pussy. He's kind of like that other guy that kept those girls trapped in his house. Old, old Miguel, what was his name? The guy, you know... Um, uh, the guy who was here in Florida who's kept those girls trapped in his house. Ariel Castro? Ariel Castro. Yeah. As soon as he... Could, he can keep a woman captive for damn eight, ten years. Yeah. No problem. But then they send him to prison. He couldn't even handle 30 days. And he couldn't take days. it. Killed himself. What a pussy. And that's what I said. It's like, it, that, it just makes me so mad because yeah. it's like they're willing to subject other people yeah. to this horrible torture, but yeah. then you do like a, a yeah. mild version, version of it to of them yeah, yeah. and they start crying right. about it. Right. But yeah, so he hung himself. Listen to this fucking suicide note because this just about made me throw up. Uh, to Rose West, Steve and May, which was, you know, two of their other kids. Well, Rose, it's your birthday on the 29th of November, 1994, and you'll be 41 and still beautiful and still lovely, and I love you. We will always be in love. The most wonderful thing in my life was when I met you. Our love is special to us. So, love, keep your promises to me. You know what they are. We are put together forever and ever is up to you. We loved Heather, both of us, even though they killed her. Right. I would love Charmaine to be with Heather and Rena. So I guess he meant buried yeah, next to yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. You will always be Mrs. West all over the world. That is important to me and you. I haven't got you a present, but all I have is my life. I will give it to you, my darling. When you're ready, come to me. I will be waiting for you. Okay. And then he hanged himself with bed sheets. Yeah. So hmm. now, like I said, so he kind of escaped justice. And a lot he of people were out. kind of uh, yeah, yeah. upset about that. Um, as I said, initially, Rosemary was only convicted um, or was only suspected of rapes and things like that. But when they figured out, like when uh, Charmaine was killed, they figured that they could uh, accuse her of at least that murder. Um, so she was actually uh, found guilty of 10 murders, ended up being guilty of 10 murders, uh, put in prison in 1995. Um, and she was given a whole life tariff, meaning she will never be let out. Although she has insisted to this very day, and like I said, she is still alive, uh, that she is innocent, and um, she has never wavered from that assertion, even though there is a lot of evidence saying yeah. otherwise. Um, but like I said, she's never going to get out, and she's even, like, taken up with, uh, she had a girlfriend for a while, um, she might still have, I don't know, I think that worked in the prison system or something like that, but so there was that kind of whole thing going on. But she was just constantly, constantly trying to get her conviction overturned. And she's like, I'm not going to be like Myra Hindley, who we're going to talk about next she time. She will never get out of prison. Yeah, she said, I'm not going to be like mm -hmm. Myra Hindley. I'm not going to die in prison and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, you probably are. On the upside, all the kids got freed and they lived, they lived normal Except lives. Except the ones that got murdered. Yeah, the ones that got freed. Yeah. <laughs> but they were on the, uh, they, they did the talk show rounds and everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and like I said, if you if you want to see some of the, um, you know, documentaries about them, stuff like that, yeah. it's actually, I mean, it's nauseating, but it's actually really interesting. And 
like you said, the kids actually did grow up and they seem very seem normal. normal. And yeah. I'm like, well, thank fuck for that. And like yeah. you said, they knew that it wasn't right. Yeah, they knew it was right even back then. And, yeah. you know, they got the fuck out they of it. They evidently hopefully. kind of stood up for each other. Yeah. You know what I mean? Tried to help each other out of there. The older ones were trying to, were warning the younger ones, you know, I'm getting out of here. You guys need to go. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. hopefully they're yeah. doing all right because, man, yep. props to you guys. Because that's fucked up. I that's can't a even hell imagine. Hell of an upbringing. That I can't even it's like imagine. Like straight out of something out of monster movies. If you go, if you put that in a movie, people would not believe it. I mean, now they yeah. would because they know about these two motherfuckers. But yeah. if you had put that in a movie before that, it'd be like, nah. That's bad shit. That can't happen. But it did. Yeah. yeah. Super fun. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Yeah, and we're not right. talking. This is England too. You know, yeah. we're not talking about the Ozarks or you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You know. right. like a pig. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would almost expect it more from yeah. like yeah. from people yeah, like that big. than just like you know these you normal. You got pretty mouth, don't you? you <laughs> <got a pretty laughs> mouth. That movie like disturbed me so much when I was a kid, like poor Ned Beatty. I was just like, oh my god, it just it bothered me so much. All right, so uh, let's take a break right now. When we come back, we're going to talk about the very famous Moore's murders, yeah, uh, perpetrated by Ian Brady and Myra Hindley, another of our killer couples for our Valentine's Day special UK edition. Yep. So we're going to be back in just a couple of minutes. Okay, everybody. Jenny's got some new shirt designs up, four of them. Really good ones, too. Atlanta Ripper, Who Put Bella in the Witch Elm, the H.H. Holmes Murder Castle, and, of course, Demon Child, because man said he could. These are updated designs. I think they look really cool. Jenny did a great job on them. Were they fun making, Jenny? They were very fun, and thank you very much. I think they came out very good. Yeah, they're really good. They're very high-quality shirts. Jenny and I wear shirt, uh, our own shirts at, at certain times when we're trying to put a spotlight on ourselves, and you can put a spotlight on yourselves. If you go ahead and pick up one of these shirts today, you guys are going to love them. Link's in the description, www.zazzle.com at 13 o'clock. Yeah, so go check out our store at www.zazzle.com slash 13 o'clock. We got these four cool new t-shirt designs plus all our old ones if you'd rather get one of the old ones. But these ones are awesome and you should check them out. They're also available in women's cut and they look really cute. Jenny's got some. So thank you. Go check them out. The Faceless Villain, a collection of the eeriest unsolved murders of the 20th century, Volume 2, includes cases spanning the years from 1960 through 1979, featuring such infamous crimes as the triple homicide at Lake Bodum, the family massacre known as the Good Heart Murders, the serial killings of the Zodiac, Bible John, Jack the Stripper, and the Freeway Phantom, the slaughter of dozens of women and girls along the Highway of Tears and the Texas Killing Fields, and the mysterious death of suspected spy, the Isdal Woman, along with dozens of other fascinating and horrifying accounts. Buy it now from Amazon in print, Kindle, or audiobook format. Okay, so this is our second couple. Yes, All this right. is our second couple on our UK edition of our Valentine's Day special about killer couples. I should note, too, that I forgot to mention that, like I said, the very famous, quote-unquote, House of Horrors, where uh, Fred and Rosemary West lived in Gloucestershire, uh, was actually demolished in 1996. And they not only demolished the house, they smashed every little piece of it so yeah. that no one would, like, you know, take any souvenirs or right. anything like that. So they just, like, fucking salted the earth. Right, yeah. So that's how they felt about that kind of shit. <laughs> so it's gone now. There's a public yeah. parkway. I've to expunge it from reality. That's what I mean. I've actually been to Gloucester. Um, I had a friend that lived there many years ago and he told me where that house was. It's not there anymore. Like I said, all right. So now we're going to talk about Ian Brady and Myra Hindley. Yeah. Two winners. Better known as yeah. the Moore's murderers. Yeah. two. Winners. Now I should say that 
I got actually interested in this case in the 1980s because I was a big Smiths fan. Still am, actually. Yeah. And on their first album, there is a song called Suffer Little Children. And in a biography of the Smiths that I read, they said, well, Morrissey had read a book called Beyond Belief by Emlyn Williams, which I have right here. I actually bought it at a library for a dollar because it was out of print at the time. Mm-hmm. And this is about the Moors murders. And uh, there's a chapter in here called Suffer Little Children, and that's what he was writing about. So I got kind of intrigued with it, so I looked it up because it seemed like something that a lot of Americans didn't know about. So that's kind of what got me interested in it, and I read the book, and I read a bunch of stuff about it. So this actually took place in the 1960s. And yeah. again, this is a fascinating case to me. Any kind, of, any killer couple is fascinating to me because just the, the fact of like two people meeting in this horrible... Um, you know, confluence of factors yeah. that's like, hey, I met this other person and like suddenly we're going to kill people together. That's just like super fucked up. Yeah, when you see them, they're like two mob kids. Yeah, basically. Which, yeah, yeah they kind of were. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about um, Ian Brady. He was actually born uh, Ian Stewart and he was born in a slum in Glasgow. And he, um, his mom was a waitress in a tea room. Uh, his father is unknown. Now, when he was little, his mom uh, couldn't really afford to take care of him, so she did kind of like a half-assed adoption. It wasn't even an adoption. She just like knew a couple and were like, hey, you want a kid? Uh, look right. after him. So they did. Uh, this couple named John and Mary Sloan. So, uh, you know, she would still come and visit, and she didn't like abandon him or anything, right. but she just couldn't uh, handle him. Couldn't take him. care of him, yeah. Right. So she would come and visit back and forth and everything like that. Now... <sighs> He seemed like a kind of a messed up kid from the beginning. Um, unlike Fred, who seemed like was okay, kind of a dummy until he got all these head injuries. Ian seemed more like a sociopath type kid. Uh, there was a lot of allegations that he tortured animals when he was growing up. Um, they said he was actually above average intelligence, but um, didn't really apply himself. Like he wasn't a very good student. He was very introverted. Um, you know, shit like that. He also, later on, he started developing kind of a weird, unhealthy uh, interest in, you know, Nazi atrocities. Uh, you know, he was super into World War II. He's super into Marquis de Sade, uh, Nietzsche. He'd like read all this kind of stuff. And he started to develop this attitude that he was like superior to everyone else. Like he kind of had that sort of thing going on. He was, you know, so he was reading all that kind of crap. And again, when he was a teenager, he started committing like petty crimes. Uh, he broke into people's houses, burglary, things like that. So he spent time in and out of like juvenile halls and whatnot. Now, while he was um, a little bit later on, he actually, his mom had remarried uh, to someone named Patrick Brady, uh, who was his stepdad. And he went and moved back in with them and took his stepdad's last name, I guess, in some way to try and make a family, I guess, or try mm. to make it seem like he was part of the family. I don't know. But he took the stepdad's last name later on. Now, while he was in jail or juvenile hall for one of these, you know, minor offenses, uh, he actually learned uh, bookkeeping and accounting and stuff like that and ended up getting a job as a stock clerk at a place called Millward's Merchandising. And this is where he met Myra Hindley. Now, Myra... Uh, was also from a pretty working class background. She was from uh, Manchester, specifically a little uh, part of Manchester called Gorton. Um, her childhood was a little, she seemed more like a normal girl. Uh, her dad did physically abuse her. Much like Rosemary West, she was actually kind of an aggressive uh, girl. When she was bullied, she would, you know, knock your ass out. So, you know, same kind of personality type there. Um, she actually, when she had a younger sister named Maureen, and when Maureen was born, she got sent off, uh, shipped off to live with the grandma, although she said she didn't mind. Um, but she was actually uh, pretty smart. She was like a, a decent student. She was good at sports and stuff like that. Didn't date a lot in school. Uh, I read somewhere that, that people called her square ass. <laughs> or I guess square arse, if you want right. <laughs> to like the, the British spelling. I guess her jeans didn't fit too well. Because, yeah, yeah, because she had like really broad hips or whatever. Right, yeah. But she, you know, she made money like as a babysitter and stuff like that. So I, no one thought anything unusual. She didn't seem like a strange person. Now, when she was 15 years old, kind of there was kind of a traumatic incident that she brought up a lot. 
She was 15 and she had a friend named Michael Higgins and she was supposed to go to this local swimming hole and go swimming with him one day and she didn't go. Uh, you know, she was kind of like, oh, I got something else to do. And he went and he drowned. Hmm. So she kind of had like really bad like survivor's guilt because she, she was a really good swimmer and she's like, if I had been there, I could have saved him and all this other kind of stuff. So she was like really traumatic, traumatized by that type of stuff. And she brought it up a lot. And at this stage, she started getting a little more like rebellious and things like that, like started bleaching her hair white and all this other kind of stuff. Now, when she, she started working uh, as a typist at the same company as Ian Brady worked at. Now, she um, really, she kind of loved him from afar for quite a while before like he even really noticed her or asked her out or anything. Now, what was the age difference? She was a little bit older. She than was, him, no, she was 18 and he was 22. Okay. Okay. So he was a little bit older than I her. I thought it was over the other way around. No, no, no. She was, uh, she was younger. All right. So, um, you know, she had dated before she had even been, been engaged before, <laughs> even though she was young, but you know, right. working class, that's, that's what they it's did. A long time ago. Yeah. It was a long time ago. And that yeah. wasn't that unusual. Yeah. Uh, but then she decided, Oh, I don't really want to get married, blah, blah, blah. So she broke it off. But she kind of got obsessed with Ian Brady because I feel like she saw him as a bad boy. Um, you know, he was very, he seemed intelligent. He seemed very intense. Um, he seemed aloof. He was kind of stylish for his income. Yeah. Too. She, um, so she wrote a lot about him, like in her diary, like she equated him with like James Dean or like Elvis yeah. or something like that, like this kind of bad boy type of image. And like I said, she wrote a lot about him. She was like totally obsessed with him for like a year and kept talking about him. And then finally, like a year later, uh, they were at this Christmas party or something for work. And he's like, Oh, you know, finally asked her out now. I heard that their first date was going to see the movie The Judgment at Nuremberg. Yeah, that sounds Romance. like something. Romance. That sounds like something. He that would sounds to go see. like something he would do. Because, yeah. like I said, pretty much immediately, like once they started dating, um, he was all teaching her, quote unquote, uh, about Nazis and about all his philosophy and about Marquis de Sade and um, trying to sort of indoctrinate her, I guess, with his ideas. It's like, oh, well, technically, if you look at it a certain way, like murder and rape isn't really wrong and like all this other kind of crap. You know what I mean? Um, he was that kind of dude. He also seemed like she seemed to change a lot to uh, please him. Uh, you know, she was had already been bleaching her hair, but she like kept doing that. She started dressing like sexier, more uh, stylish, more mod looking. Uh, and everything like that. If you see pictures of her from the time, she does look very mod and stylish, uh, kind of glamorous. He you know actually I mean? sounds like one of the Columbine shooters. Like, he kind of yeah, sounds like, that's who he reminds me what's of. What's his name? Harris? Ha yeah. And Kevin Klebold. And Klebold, yeah. He sounds like, yeah, he sounds like one of those guys. They were into that. They were into KMFDM and, you know. Nothing wrong with KMFDM. type stuff. But, yeah. Uh, national socialism, but mostly, you know, it's just, just more about style over substance, most of it. And, uh, you know, it's easy to take Nietzsche and read yourself into what Nietzsche is saying. Yeah. You know, Nietzsche's been abused for, you know, almost a hundred years. And, you can, yeah. you can read yourself and you read yourself into what Nietzsche is saying. He's not talking about you. You're a loser. You know, that's, <laughs> that's what. <laughs> yeah. Well, I feel like, and okay, I feel like this is an issue, like with a lot of dudes of this type, and this is yeah. a very, like, Ian Brady's personality seems very much to me like uh, a lot of the kind of mass shooter type personalities mm -hmm. um, and that kind of thing, where it's somebody that's not, they're not like a super genius, but they're like above they're average above intelligence. Average. They're intelligent enough to think that they're, they're smarter, smarter than, than everyone somebody. else, but, but they're they not smart enough to know that they're not smarter than everyone yeah. else. Do you and, know what I'm and, saying? And they're also not smart enough, or they're also not old enough or accomplished enough to have true power because they don't have any true accomplishments yet. Yeah. They're early in their history, a lot of them. Yeah. So, you know, you can't go around being the fucking Nietzschean ubermensch <laughs> at, at 19 and you're right. you know working on a minimum wage job and you, yeah. don't, you don't even have a car Nietzsche you and know? teenage boys that shit doesn't mix that because didn't mix. Yeah. yeah well because uh, Nietzsche was not talking about you okay <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, the problem too, like a lot of teenage boys and a lot yeah. of teenage girls too, um, you know, they think they're smarter than ever. They know everything, yeah. and it's like you can't tell them shit because they already think I'm immortal and I know everything and I'm yeah. smarter than everybody. And it's like you're seriously, you're not. And I know, like all old people say that to you, but they're saying it to you because it's true, not just to be mean. There's something um, about being wise. Yeah. Have it seen. All te- all of us have gone through it. All yes. of us were teenagers. We remember feeling like that. And now we feel really, really dumb. And Life so will you. Life educates you in a very different way yeah. over time. So you will you. That You'll see. You become great when you realize you ain't shit. That's part of exactly. it. Exactly. When you realize that exactly. you ain't shit, that's when you start having a chance. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I think that's a good way of putting it. Like, yeah. don't don't shit on yourself like like yeah. you suck and you're the worst. It's and not what it like means. That. No, it's you just have to understand that you're not special. Yeah. You're not special. That's all. And, yeah. and you have to kind of like, you know, kind of struggle and get what you want. You know, the way. Everything it. imposes on everything else. Yeah. Really. And you might think, you might think that you can impose your will on other people. But there are a lot of other people that can impose their will on you. And namely they will. The, namely the police. Yeah. Okay. The police and the judicial system can impose its will over you bigger than a motherfucker. You yeah. know why? They got guns. <laughs> they got guns and, and, and you can kill one of them and it means nothing. They'll just keep swarming you. They'll send 10,000 armed I mean. men after you. even if you, you have mean, guns. shit. So don't many. matter. So. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Get the, get over yourself. Yeah, and I think that's st- that's good advice for en- for yes. anyone really. Get over yourself. Yeah, the Uber bench. <laughs> you know what the the kind of power Nietzsche was talking about is he talking about state power. Really had a lot to do with what they were talking yeah. about. He was talking about guys like you know, literally he was talking about guys kind of like Adolf Hitler, really. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and others. He wasn't the only but one. Yeah. There's a lot of guys like that. So, like I said, yeah. yeah, Ian Brady definitely seemed like that kind of dude. He was all, he's, um, you know, she would come over to his house. He j- he always had German wine. He was always, like, lecturing her about Nazis and about Nietzsche and about Marquis de Sade. German wine. Dostoevsky. Huh? Yeah. yeah, it's like, the, let's go on a date. See the German, wa- Harbor, German wine Christ. ain't got shit on California wine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ger- a German wine is not something anybody ever talks I wouldn't be about. Bragging French about wine, that. Cal- California yeah, wine, yeah, yeah but yeah. Italian wines, German yeah. wine, you don't really hear about it. German beer, sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, but okay. So, um, also, she had actually been brought up a Catholic and was actually fairly religious, but the longer she hung out with him, the more she kind of went in an atheistic direction because he, I guess he was telling her she was a dummy for believing in God or whatever. Um, and at this stage, I think that her family and her friends and stuff started to notice a change in her. Um, like I said, she started to dress more glamorous, more stylish. She started getting real um, surly. She started like keeping secrets from them, like not telling them where she was going and shit like that. Um, they also think at this point that Ian Brady wanted to see how much power he had over her. So the first thing that he supposedly did was he was like, well, we're going to do like a bank robbery or a big bank heist or something like that. So you need to like um, set that up. He wanted to see if she would do it. Uh, you know, just go rent a van, go do, do this, that, and the other thing. And she did it without questioning him. At, and at this stage, he's like, okay, well, now I know that that's, you know, that I have a power over or something like that. Like I said, allegedly. Now, after that, you know, after this incident where she seemed to go along with his plans for criminality without really questioning him, then he starts talking about how he wants to commit the perfect murder. And so this is where things start going off the rails. Yeah, this is kind of a weird fantasy. I'm going to commit the perfect murder. Yeah. And that. another thing, too, that pisses me off. Of course, off, it's going gonna, it's gonna to involve a teenage girl. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, these two, this motherfucker, I, like I, I said. I would think the perfect murder would involve millions of dollars also. You would think. You would think that. Well, But and, that shows you how how low this guy's standards are. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm going to kill some cute girl. And it's going to be perfect. Well, and little kids. Little kids, It was yeah. mostly little kids. Little kids, yeah. That's right. I forgot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, their first victim was a 16-year-old girl. But although I've heard that, um, because what they would do is he would ride his motorcycle like behind um, the van that Myra was driving. Like they would rent a van and she would drive it. And he would ride on the motorcycle behind her. 
and they would ride around looking for a victim. And he said, well, I'll flash my headlight at you when I see somebody that I want you to stop and pick up because she was his, you know, she was the hook, right? She's a woman. She's in the van by herself. You know, no one would think anything of it. And actually this was like a pretty small town. A lot of people knew her. So it's not like she was a complete stranger. Being a motorcycle man myself, I must <laughs> ask, do you have any idea what kind of motorcycle no, he I had? No, I don't know. I bet you it was a BSA. <laughs> I bet you it was a BSA or a Triumph, something like that. Probably a little Tiger, something like, you know, single cylinder. Okay, good. Yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to think of a British motorcycle from the time. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a BSA 500, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I've heard that the first time they went out to find the first victim, that he flashed the light at her when he saw like a young girl, like well, I believe she was like eight or something like that. And Myra said, didn't stop. Um, and then he kind of yelled at her like, why didn't you stop? I told you to stop. And she said, no, I know that little girl, mm. you know, so we have to look for somebody else. Now I've heard that. I don't know if that's entirely true or not. Um, but this particular night, which was July 12th, 1963, they did eventually find a victim. And this was 16 year old Pauline Reed. Now she was walking to uh, a dance like in the area. So, uh, Hindley comes up to her and says, Hey, you know, can you come help me? This is usually how she would do it. She'd say, Hey, can you help, help me look for a glove that I lost? Or, you know, can you help me with these packages or something like that? And like I said, you know, people knew her around town. She'd been babysitting and stuff like that. So it wasn't all that weird. Uh, so they would get in the van. Um, so they pick up Pauline Reed and then they drive to Saddleworth Moor, uh, which is kind of a remote uh, area outside of town there. At which point uh, Ian took the girl, raped her and strangled her and buried her on the moor. Now there is some controversy about whether... Myra was present. Myra says that she just sat in the van, even though she knew what was going on. I doubt uh, it. But she said, but yeah, but Ian Brady later said, no, she was there and she helped uh, mm. in the sexual assault, helped facilitate it. Um, so, like I said, Myra has always denied, you know, oh, I was always somewhere else. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, in this case, I always wonder, what the fuck does she get out of this? I mean, well, yeah. see, that's what makes me wonder about this really... kind of stuff. It's like, yeah. why? Yeah. And, you know, later, I'll get into it a little bit later on because, yeah. you know, she, um, she said a lot of shit later on, like before she died, uh, about, uh, how he was forcing her into this kind of stuff. But it I, it, sound like I don't it. buy that. Yeah. Um, but I'm not saying that he wasn't a shit heel and that he might have co coerced her, but. We definitely she, coerced her. Yeah. She definitely did seem so like obsessed with him that she, she would basically do anything he asked yeah, her to do. Yeah, that's what I think it was. I think that's essentially what it was. She was just trying And to then she was trying to like impress him. It's like show look how with, badass yeah. I am. I'll help you murder people. Right, yeah. I definitely think. So it's I don't of, I think it was kind of like a sign of, of allegiance and loyalty to the guy. Yeah, I think and that's she was exactly what it was. To do whatever for him, you know? I think that's exactly that what it was. That she'd be his Igor, his henchman. Yeah. You know? That's, you know. I think she thought that it was like bringing them closer together. Like it was some kind of yeah. like weird. And Ian Brady said that too. But, he said, I think she saw it like little marriage ceremonies. Like yeah. it was like bonding them. But or what's weird is like, baby, prove to me how much you love me by letting me screw this other woman. That's what I and mean. Then I'm that is kill messed her. up. That's some weird shit. Man. Yeah. It's like, a, well, a normal person, a normal yeah. person, if some dude said that to me, like, if, if said I said that, that shit to you, you'd I call just the pop cop. you in the <laughs> face. Yeah, she'd, she'd fucking shoot me, you motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, I probably would. I, would I wouldn't blame you. I wouldn't shoot you. I, I might, would. okay, I might shoot you in the kneecaps. I might if shoot I ever you ask you to do some shit like that, you, you fucking call the cops. Okay, thank you. I would I will. never fucking do that. I know you that. wouldn't. You wouldn't do that. You just don't do that kind of stuff. But like I said, if you did, I might not shoot you in the face, but that's I might shoot you in the kneecaps. That's fucking sick shit. Yeah, man. that's messed up. Yeah. Um. So yeah, just for the record. Yeah. So yeah, Pauline Reed, 16 years old, was their first victim. Four months later, November 23rd, 1963, their next victim was a 12-year-old little boy named John Kilbride. He was uh, in a market, like shopping in a market in a place called Ashton under Line, and was kidnapped from there. Same type of thing where Myra came up to say, hey, can you help me unpack these boxes or can you help me like find this glove or whatever? And then kidnapped, uh, taken to the moor where Ian Brady apparently uh, raped him, strangled him and yeah. buried him on the moor. So right there, you know, the boy is bisexual. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, like I said, but three of the victims were male and two were female. Right. Then came uh, June 16th, 1964. I uh, think Myra was watching. I think she was, too. Yeah. Like I said, she denied it later. Yeah. But I, I don't buy that. He, was, he did that, that for her. Yeah. It's a weird shit. Yeah. Just saying. Uh, their next victim was also a 12-year-old boy named Keith Bennett. He was walking to his grandmother's house in June of 1964, as I said. Um so same kind of thing she lures him into the van and then uh raped strangled and buried on the moor the next one and this is the kind of the famous one because of the very famous audio tape uh was a 10 year old girl leslie ann downey and this happened on boxing day which is december 26th 1964. Mm. she was actually uh at a local fairground she was standing by a ride and Myra came up to her and realized that her parents weren't around. So she was kind of like, hey, why don't you come and help me with this stuff and everything? And the little girl was like, oh, okay. You know, and then she went along with her. Uh, and this little girl, they actually took her back to their house and tied her up and raped her and tortured her over several hours. And they recorded it. Yeah, I heard some of it. Like, an audio recording. It is the most horrible. Yeah. And I've only heard like bits of it. You just don't, that girl, please don't listen to it. That girl was crying and begging so bad. She was I, begging for her mom and she was like, Oh my God, it's terrible. horrifying. And they, they, I think they played, it was, I think it was 16 minutes or something yeah. like that. And I think they played the whole thing in court. I heard that shit and I wanted to set them two on fire. Most people did. Yeah, I would set them on fire. Yeah. Put some sterno on their That's heads. That's fucking too good just for them, man. Just paint some sterno on top of their heads. God, and put how the set on fire. You, how can just you? Just slowly cook their heads. Oh man. That's fucking horrifying. What they did to that girl was fucking, oh man. Yeah, she was I, just like begging and stuff. Yeah. It was just like, it was horrible. I can't horrible. understand that. And they took photo, they took pictures of her. Yeah, and they were like doing kind of like, like. Polaroids? They were doing kind of like an inquisition on her. Like it was uh, like a, uh, uh, kind of like a, a Gestapo interrogation. Is yeah. what they were pretending that like it was. That girl just wanted to go home, man. It's fucking terrible, terrible shit. Yeah. Blood curling. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Now make you mad. It makes you really mad. Yeah. Well, yeah. you can see why, because the everybody in the courtroom had to hear that. You can see uh, the hor I mean, the reaction that people had to those two, and particularly because he died um, much later than her. I mean, yeah. she died pretty early. But that shit right there. It just goes to show you how immoral it is not to have a death penalty. Because there are some people out there that need their asses fucking killed. And it's weird because say. the death penalty over there had just been overturned like Not before yet. they were no. um, caught. Like yeah. very shortly before they were caught. And you know, and this lethal injection, that's too weak. You know, they, they need to be hung by the neck until they're dead. Like they did in the old west. They didn't even drop them. They just fucking hang them like that. I mean, some people... Yeah. I'm generally against it for just minor shit, but some people... No, like, some this kind of stuff... Bad. Yeah. In, and in some ways, I think the death penalty is too good for them. Well, you see, I said hanging them from the neck until they're dead, like the 1800s, because that's traditional for, for our country here. You know what I mean? But really, if it was up to me, if I was making the rules... For shit like this, I would have done what the ancient Greeks did. At least one of the ancient. I would have given them what was called the the, the bronze bull. Oh yeah, where you I know put them in a is. bull and you put a fire underneath them. Yeah, you just and you like roast cook them, them alive. You pretty yeah. much roast yeah. them alive. Yeah, Ro yeah. That's that's what these two. Because that would probably take a while. Take a long time, man. And like I said, there's very very few people like deserve that. But if I'd anybody does, bull. if anybody does, these two do. Yeah, for that for a homicide like that, yeah. So, yeah, so those were their victims. Now, their last victim was the one that actually got them caught because they'd been getting away with this up to this point. Now, their last victim was a guy named Edward Evans, and he was actually 17. Um, apparently, I'm not sure why they decided on him in particular. I think they just went to a bus station and picked him up. Uh, you know, I think there was some... There was something where Ian or or the or uh, Myra's brother-in-law David Smith said something about let's go roll a queer or something like that. So they go and pick up this guy Edward Evans. They bring him back to the house, and um, so they're talking to him now. David Smith, who was Myra's sister's husband, 
Uh, Myra had, a, like I said, a younger sister named Maureen, and she had married this guy, David Smith. David Smith was at the house, um, and Ian gets into an argument with this Edward Evans person and basically starts beating him with the blunt side of an axe and then, like, strangles him. Now, David Smith sees this whole thing. So he's, like, obviously upset about it, but he's, like, also scared I mean, before this, he had been kind of like, he looked up to Ian Brady, probably for the same reasons that Myra Hindley did. They thought he was cool, I guess. Um, but when he saw this, he was like horrified. So then he was afraid that they would kill him as well. So he helped them like kind of clean up the area and was like, yeah, I totally won't tell anybody. But then he went home, told Myra's sister Maureen, holy shit, they just killed somebody. And then they went to the cops. Yeah, dumbass. Yeah, so that whole thing happened. So you know who else this guy reminds me of? He reminds that? me of fucking Charles Starkweather a little bit too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah so Starkweather. yeah, so at this point, like the cops did a, a, b immediately believe them, so they go to Ian Brady and Myra Hindley's house, and they find Edward Evans. His body is still there. It was like wrapped up in a fucking blanket, and it's in like Ian's bedroom or something like that. Now, initially, when police came to the house and found. Edward Evans' body, uh, Ian Brady says, okay, well, me and David Smith and Edward Evans, we all got in a big fight and it got out of hand. Myra doesn't have anything to do with it. So Myra actually didn't get arrested uh, with the rest of them until four days later until they were searching her car and they found like a document in there which said like where she had written down like they were planning the murder or something like that because it's not like criminal masterminds or anything like that. Now... It also came to pass that Brady had blabbed to David Smith that he's like, oh, I've killed other people, too. We buried them on Saddleworth Moor. Hmm. Now, here's the fucked up shit is that there are pictures because they used to, you know, Ian and Myra used to go hang out on this moor. Like he would take pictures of her and they think that some of the pictures that he took of her are over the graves of the people that they killed. Wow. Like she's like, hey, stand there over the where we buried that kid and right. I'll take a picture. Isn't that cool or whatever? I don't Weird. know. It's fucked up. So, you know, after David Smith told the police that they said, okay, well we need to go start digging on Saddleworth more. So they start digging because they ob obviously had all these missing children cases in the area that they were beginning to link to these two assholes. Um, the body of Leslie Ann Downey was found first uh, on October 10th, 1965. Uh, 11 days later, they found the body of 12-year-old John Kilbride. Hmm. So at this stage, they're like, okay, well, we found the bodies. There was missing children. This, like, yes, he killed this teenage uh, guy in his house, like, supposedly after an argument. But there wasn't any solid evidence, like, tying them to the murders of these two kids that they had found. However... When they searched the house more thoroughly, they found like a ticket for a, um, you know, when you go to a train station and you check your luggage and yeah. you put it in a locker. Okay, they found one of those. And they went to uh, Manchester Central Station and they found the locker. And inside the locker was a suitcase. And inside the suitcase were the pictures of Leslie Ann Downey and the audio tape that they'd made of her. It was in this suitcase. So at this point, they knew that these two were the fuckers that had killed them. So they were still deny, deny, deny. They were not guilty, not guilty. They are still trying to pin everything on David Smith. Um, they said, oh, well, yeah, Leslie Ann Downey was at our house, but we let her go alive. So David Smith must have chased her and killed her later on and stuff. Hmm. And police were like, yeah, tell us. Yeah, you're right. So, right. So the two of them are brought to trial in uh, April of 1966, pled not guilty to all charges. Now, the media is like having a fucking field day. They're like, you know, it's funny because the British tabloids, even British regular newspapers, are much meaner than American ones. Yeah. And it's like they'll say all kind of horrible shit about it. They'll call you a monster like right to your face. Um, not much you can do about it. But uh, yeah, so this it was like a big deal. It was like fucking packed to the raptors. So... Trial actually did not last that long. May 1966, uh, Ian Brady was found guilty of the murders of Leslie Ann Downey, John Kilbride, and Edward Evans. Uh, Hindley was found guilty of uh, the murders of Leslie Ann Downey and Edward Evans. Also, she was found guilty of harboring Ian Brady, 
even after she knew that he had committed a murder. So that was another uh, charge against her too. Um, because they hadn't found the other bodies yet, uh, and Brady and Hindley had not confessed to them, uh, then they weren't charged with the other ones yet. Uh, so, but they both got 30 years, which were later, uh, made into a whole life tariff, like I said, so they would never get out. Um, later on in the 1980s, they actually ended up finding, uh, Pauline, the, their first victim, they found that body. However, sadly, uh, Keith Bennett, the body has never been found. And the sad thing is if I saw a documentary about, uh, these, about the Moore's murders and his mother kept... She kept writing to them to, when they were in prison, them. asking, please, you know, where is my son? And Myra actually went out to the moors a couple of times with the police and was trying to find them. That's how they found Pauline's body. Uh, but they never did find Keith Bennett's body. And unfortunately, his mother passed away uh, before they found him. They still have not found uh, his so body. So she tried to find it, but she couldn't figure out where it was. Yeah, yeah. There wasn't any markers, were, yeah. more or less, where it was. And Ian, the so. thing about it is that I was listening to um, an investigator on the case that had actually talked to both of them, like, extensively. And it was like, the thing about Ian was that he was real um, difficult. Like, he would always be like, oh, well, yeah, I'll help you by showing you the bodies, but, you know, you have to do this for me and blah, blah, blah. They're like, Myra was much more helpful like right. you know they, she said okay i'll show you where the bodies were and they did actually find one uh you know when she went out there but you know it, he just seemed like oh well what are you gonna do for me and then i'll tell you where it was you know what i mean like a fucking sociopath to me the the case sounds a lot like the stark weather case it does yeah it's very similar but i would say character wise he's kind of like what's his name was this harris pat uh from the Columbine shooters, yeah, Patrick Harris, I think the name was. Or what was, was his it? first name? Dylan Klebold, and the other one was something uh, under Harris. Shit, no, I can't I remember his first name. And uh, Klebold, if I remember correctly, he was the one. He was just kind of all over the place, jittery. Yeah. But the other one was kind of more rational. This kind of sounds like him, really. Yeah. You know, Ian. Yeah. But uh, still, although I would say this is is that. Uh, um. Harris wouldn't have uh, gone after little kids like that, though. It was, there yeah, wasn't a sexual like, motive. They were just angry at the school. Yeah. And, I, you know, I've mentioned before in, in other episodes that I knew some uh, people that went to that school and grew up, and they said that was a fucking shitty-ass school to go to. Well, in a way, it's like I'm not condoning it, but that's more yeah. understandable to yeah. me. Because especially if you're bullied and picked on and stuff, I can see, like, snapping and kill. I can see that. I Colum can see that. Columbine was a yuppie yuppie school with a bunch of yuppie yuppie parents, and if you didn't fit in with the yuppie culture, then you they just treated you like shit. Yeah, and but this it. kind of shit where you just go this around shit here picking is just up, uncalled for. Yeah, right. just picking up little random children. And if they treat, even... no, don't take my words out of context. If they're treating you like shit at school, doesn't mean shoot it up. You know, don't do that. Yeah, Wait, obviously, you're gonna get out in a couple of years. What the fuck are you thinking? That's what I mean. It's like yeah. high school does not mean yeah. anything in the no. grand scheme of things. Yes, it sucks. High yeah. school. But well, you can wait that out. Yeah. High school sucked for me. Well, except for my last year. I had fun that year. But, you know, up until then it had sucked. But I, so I understand that feeling. Right. But it's like in the greater scheme of things, it's not going to mean anything. In no. a couple of years, you won't even fucking remember it. Believe me. I only had, only my uh, freshman year kind of sucked in Michigan. Actually, it was a sophomore Mostly year. Mostly my Michigan. junior high yeah. sucked. High school but was okay. The rest of the time, I loved it, man. When I was a sophomore, when I was a junior and a senior, I thought, man, I ran the show. Well, I was were, a prom king. You were prom king. I was prom and everything. king. Yeah, I was prom he was like super popular. I was super popular. I was, and I was like a weirdo goth yeah. chick. <laughs> I hung yeah. out with all the. Well, punk I was a weirdo I, too. I hung out with all the punk rockers, like I was, behind the bleachers, smoking and shit. <laughs> I was in drama though. I was in drama, yeah, so I, I was used in to chorus. Do a lot of musicals and uh, knew all the cool girls, and they ended up being celebrities. Marilyn Rice Cub, you know, she's from Twenty Four. She's Mike's girlfriend. She's she made it. Yeah. And no, uh, uh, let's see who else did I know? Um, Parker Posey. Yeah. You know, so. It was just a different time, you know. But yeah. um, I was a misfit that fucking became popular. Yeah. It yeah. happens sometimes. It ha yeah. Not in my case. Yeah, and all the jocks fucking want to hang out with me and shit. <laughs> 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 well, there was kind of like... Them the, street cred. The, there was kind of this, you know, there, I was, you know, they were alpha males and I was like a sigma. Yeah, you know, but, yeah. You know, and the sigma is like an alpha male gone wrong. So, <laughs> I like that definition. Yeah, that's what a sigma. I was a sigma male, so, you know. I like that definition. Yeah. 
But yeah, so uh, both of them, like, Myra goes to prison. Ian was actually sent to uh, Ashworth Psychiatric Hospital for the Criminally Insane. Um, he actually tried several times to starve himself to death. Like, he would go on hunger strikes and uh, things of that nature. Um, essentially, and I read this, they're like, if, if it's in prison... And a prisoner goes on hunger strike. They're just like, okay, fuck you, starve to death. You know what I mean? Over there. Yeah. But if you're in a psychiatric hospital and you're starving to death has to do with your mental illness, which in this case it did, then they're like, okay, well, we have to force feed you because you have a mental illness. So they actually force fed him. And he was like, he was trying to um, like sue essentially to get the government to allow him to starve himself to death. Hmm. You know what I mean? Um, like I said, later on, Myra... Uh, kind of came out and tried to say that he had forced her to do all this stuff, that he uh, would rape her and beat her and threaten to kill her family. Um, I'm not sure how true any of that is, or if she's just trying, if she was just trying to, uh, you know, not, not seem like such a shithead because as much as Ian Brady seemed like the instigator in all this, for whatever reason, the British public hated Myra Hindley with the heat of a thousand suns like more than more than him that's because she was the she was the girl she's a girl and she was supposed to know better i kind of that's what i feel like it is because yeah. i was like well what he did was probably much worse yeah. and it's like if they had not met she probably she's would have had a normal life she's supposed to be a life. protector of children right. and a nurturer and i think that's exactly what it she is she was supposed to return him in and report him yeah, you know, I think that's what it that's is. That's so, exactly why. So there's mu there was much more hatred. I feel like there was much more hatred directed at her than there was at him. Not that there wasn't hatred directed at him, because there was. Um, you know what I mean? When they were arrested, anytime they were like transported anywhere, like the huge mobs, and they were well, like, they're just considering him to just be your, They're just considering him to be a, a, a maniac. Yeah, she's supposed to be this girl who could have stopped it. Like that's I said, I was thinking about this earlier. I was thinking about. Because remember, I think I mentioned this on uh, a previous show that what 85% of serial killers are men and 90% of murderers, just one-off murderers, are men. So it's almost like if a man murders somebody, no one is surprised. Yeah, right. But when a woman does it, it's like a big, huge deal because it doesn't right. really happen that often. It's like, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to be, you know what I mean? So I think that's probably the case. Supposed, she's supposed to be better than in that. In this situation, she's supposed to be better than that. And yeah. she wasn't. So, you know, that's why all the hatred uh, against her. Like I said, um, she actually ended up uh, dying quite a bit before him. She died at the age of 60 in 2002 of bronchial pneumonia. Mm. And like I said, right before she died, she turned in all these papers where she had written this big, long, like, autobiographical thing, like, talking about, um, you know, how he had forced her into it. And she wasn't even there most of the time. Like, she was in the van or she was in the bathroom or she lying. was... She's yeah, lying. that's what yeah. I mean. I, I, I'm kind of not buying it. I don't think anybody else did lying. either. Um, because Ian Brady is sh as shitty as he was. He's like, no, she was there. She was in on the whole thing. She was into it too. Um, so. Which is far more likely. I, I think that's a lot more likely because yeah. it did seem, I read some of the papers that she had, um, well, I don't it, think they've been published in their entirety, but it did seem like, oh, you were always in the kitchen or you were always yeah. on the other side of the ridge. Like when the so, show was going down, so you're not in on, that. you're not in on this, Myra, you're hiding, you're averting your eyes. You don't want to be there for all this, but you sure as hell don't rat him out. Yeah. It's like you she could I mean? have gone to the cops. Yeah. If you felt that way, you would have gone to the cops. I mean, what really she could say, was yeah, just, I'm afraid of him, which maybe she was, but... She was a spectator. Yeah. She was getting a thrill out of it. I think she... I do feel like that. Yeah. Like I said, I'm not saying... Basically, she got live snuff porn. Yeah. That's what she was getting I'm like. not saying... Like, I think that if she hadn't met him, she probably would have just been a normal person. But I think that she had a particular proclivity. Yeah, and he pressed those buttons. Yeah, like a particular personality type that yeah. was like... Um, you know, susceptible, susceptible to right. that type of thing, that yeah. type of manipulation. Um, so and when she met him, there was like a horrible, there like a synergy going synergy on. Synergy between then when them. When he's showing her this stuff, she's reacting to it with fucking emotions, and then like she gets kind of like she gets into that. Yeah. You know, the thrill of it. And maybe she. And then all of a sudden, she feels closer to him because. Yeah. She, he That's trusted her. That's what he her. said. That's yeah. what he said. He trusted her, so now you know she. It, it's like it's like a relationship tighter than marriage. Yeah. Because they have dirt on one another. 
Yeah. Basically. And that's, he mm. actually came out, I mean, like I said, as much of a fuckstick as he is, yeah. he did seem pretty articulate about the reasons that she stayed around. Well, she was And thinking, that's pretty much essentially yeah, what he said. Now that she's in on this, he's not going anywhere. Yeah. So now they can. Yeah, be in because a like, hey, if you break he, up with yeah, me, I'm he, just gonna tell on he you. He can't break up with me. That's mm-hmm. what she's thinking. Just you know. Yeah, so there might have been. He loves me. Yeah. There might have been that kind of thing because of she did seem, and like I said, when she hooked up with him, she was very young. She was only 18, and she, like I said, she had obsessed about him from afar for like a year before. That's old enough to know better, though. That is old enough to know better. Yeah. You definitely yeah. should. Like I said, <coughs> the second some dude, <coughs> girl's just telling you, the second some dude is like, hey, I'm going to go, let's pick up a girl and I'm going to go rape her over here. Go you, to the cops. You just shoot that dude yeah, in the face. Yeah, shoot that or, dude go to, the face. or go to the cops. Yeah, you shoot him, in, then you're going to end up in court. <laughs> I know. You know what I mean? <laughs> if you can get if away, If you do shoot him the in the fu- face, yeah. then bury him somewhere where no And don't say fight. nothing to nobody. Yeah. Yeah. Just drop them in a lake somewhere this, with a rock tied to their ankle, but just this, don't say anything. This show should, you know, this show should be an example this of how... This is a joke. I'm just kidding. <laughs> the criminal justice system, no matter what country, kind of they t- tend to get it wrong. They have a tendency to get it wrong. If you, if a dude is going to go out and murder some girl, and you're his date, and you shoot him in the face, and then call the cops, he was going to go murder some girl. And they say, well, you didn't have to shoot him. That's exactly what they would say. Like, you yeah, I kind of did, though. And then they charge you with first-degree murder, second-degree murder. Probably second-degree murder, I would tell Yeah, you. and you spend the rest of your life in prison. Don't fucking do that. Don't, don't play the games. Like I said, unless you you're sure that you're not going to get caught. Wait a minute, now. Oh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just, just kidding. Just go to the cops if you can. Yeah. Although they might not believe you. That's kind of like, yeah. but, but at least try. At least try. Um, yeah, so she died in 2002. Uh, like I said, the British newspapers, when she died, very large headlines said rot in hell, which I thought was very nice. Uh, Brady didn't die till 2017. Wow. He was 79 years old. Still old man. Uh, apparently he has written an autobiography, but I don't think it's been, uh, cause they said the stipulation has to be, he's, you know, he has to be dead before they can publish it. I don't think they've published it yet, actually. Um, I know this is fucked up, but I'm actually kind of curious to read it. Maybe. Maybe no. it'll, ju- it'll just make me mad. Probably. I don't think there's much there. Although, I have to say, like, we've been watching, um, you know, <coughs> when we recorded this, uh, Netflix just put up the, the Ted Bundy tapes, you know, mm. the new series about Ted Bundy. And, you know, it's a lot of shit that he said, like, in interviews with a with a journalist back in, back in the day, like in 1980 or whatever. And I don't know. I, just, I find them fascinating because I'm like, what? In a way, they're... they're the way they think is like so alien to me that I'm, I'm just kind of interested in like what angle they're coming from. So in that sense, I'd be kind of interested to read it. A lot of it was lies. Although I think yeah. I'd be more interested to read her account because I want to hear her excuses as to what. It wouldn't, it wouldn't probably read too well because she was doing this at the age of 18. Yeah. <laughs> After decades in prison. Okay. And missing so much development and so much time passing by, the information that she would give you would be really distorted. Yeah. Because, you know what I mean? You're dealing with like a 60-something-year-old woman that really hadn't lived a real life past 18. Yeah. She's just in this institution. And she's going to be telling you the way she felt a long time ago in a culture that's long gone. I don't even remember anything from when I was 18. Right, so... I don't remember how I felt. She's telling you about memories of memories of memories. Yeah. Without a modern context. Which have probably been reconstructed. Right, without without a modern context because they don't live in the modern world. They're incarcerated into a prison that's almost unchanging. Yeah. It's like that same culture, you know. So... You wouldn't learn much from it. She'd just be basically lying whether or not she knew she was lying or not. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? And that's, They can't deliver accurate information to you. And that's something that, like I said, the one of the investigators on the case that had uh, spoken with both of them extensively um, that was saying the shit about, you know, Ian Brady was very difficult and he would only help you if he thought he was going to get something out of it. He said Myra was actually a lot more helpful, but... He did say that she was also highly intelligent and very manipulative. Yeah. He did say that about her. So, And they'd be talking about something that happened in the 60s. Yeah. The world has changed a lot since then. That was a long time ago, yeah. you guys. But yeah, so like I said, th- this case has always fascinated me. And this is actually, I don't know if this is probably still, 
it was out of print when I bought it, but that was like a long time ago, uh, the book Beyond Belief. Um, it's actually, it's strange because it's kind of, it's written in uh, a sort of Mancunian patois, which if you're not really familiar with that area, like it might be kind of a hard read because you know what I mean? It's, it's almost kind of written in a dialect. Um, but you, I guess, cause he's from there too. So he was like, you know, it was something that happened local to his area, the author, but trying to figure out, trying to figure out the motivations of serial killers from a long time ago is very difficult. It is. Yeah. I mean, you might, well, even to, from nowadays, it's right. Difficult. I mean, imagine trying to, di trying to dissect Albert Fish. I mean, Albert Fish was created by that forces. That dude is mystifying to and, me. And he was created by forces from the 1800s. He was created by societal forces that no yeah. longer exist. True. People like that are not created anymore because the society you need to create those doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. So asking him why he did certain things from a modern point of view, you're never really going to understand it because you don't really understand the world that they came from. Because you're, yeah, they're, they're, a large part of the context is gone. It's gone, right. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. So that's, it, you have a much easier time trying to understand a serial killer from our time. Yeah. Yeah. Because one thing that I do... Uh, context has a lot to do with it. Yeah, yeah. because I'm going to say, it's like, I'm not saying that some people aren't born messed up or born they are. with like... Yeah. They are. Yeah. But there has to be a particular... Uh, push and pull between a person that's born with a particular mental proclivity and the environment they grow up in. And I think I've mentioned this before, even if someone is born kind of messed up or with a proclivity toward being a serial killer, let's say, um, but they grow up in a normal home, they have normal. So in that way, they might not have gone down that road. Whereas if they had grown up, say in an abusive household, yeah. then they might have. I think it has to be two factors. I don't think, maybe, maybe in very rare cases, no matter what, how the kid was brought up, maybe they would just be fucked up. And I'm sure that happens in a very small percentage. But I think most of the time you need both both of those factors working in tandem, I think. Well, consider this. Remember that show we did a few months back about the guys in the 1800s? There were the two brothers that were going on capture. The Hart brothers, The yeah. Hart brothers, yeah. You can look look at what the Hart brothers did. You go, man, those motherfuckers were nasty. I mean, you know, that would yeah. be like some badass serial killers today. But a lot of what they did in their time back in the 1800s, all right? Wasn't that bad. That was a lot like what the Apache did. Yeah, it the wasn't. The Apache captured people and enslaved them and captured women and made them yeah. sex slaves and killed people and cut their heads off and scalped people and, tra you know, they did so... When you it look at those two brothers, are, are, time, are you talking about serial killers? Or you just talk, talking about tribal warriors. What what are we talking about? Yeah, you'd have to be there and really understand the context. Although the fact that we remember them means that they probably went a little over the top. Well, they were definitely nuts, but yeah. people of the time would they would say, "Well, those two just went engine," because yeah. that was a term, and not that was a term yeah. that they did back then. Which maybe that's what happened. Maybe they were hanging out with some pretty aggressive tribal warriors and they just kind of adopted those ways. Or like, you know what? Let's just do it the way they do it. Yeah. We're just going to capture women and kill men and make people our slaves. And it's like some shit out of Conan. Yeah. Basically, you know. Like I said, it's it wouldn't have been remarked upon as much back then, I guess. Because a lot of people yeah. were doing horrible shit. Yeah. Because the world was a fucked up place back then. Yeah. But you Which... take that situation and you put it into a suburban setting... In the 1900s. Well, yeah, no one's going to put up with It looks very that. different. Yeah, exactly. You know? And you did that nowadays. Yeah. It's like, holy shit. That's right. <laughs> it would bring out the fucking FBI mm -hmm. and the fucking, the, you know. Yeah. So it. To take you out. Yeah. We don't put up with that shit anymore. No. That's good, though. I. That's good. It, that makes me feel better because at least we're a little more fucking civilized. Yeah. Than that. That's, it, yeah. it, it bothers me that. You know, back in the day, well, back in the you day, could you, do that shit. You had to do a lot of it before people would even comment on it. Back in those days, there was no legal infrastructure or no societal structure to violate. They were just yeah. existing in the wild. Yeah. Basically, you know, and that was a survival strategy. Steal. Yeah. You know, stealing was a survival strategy. Like some shit out of Mad Max. Basically yeah. is what you're talking about. I was going to say, too, when we were talking about... Um, 
Brady and Hindley and when we were saying that a lot of people uh, harbored a lot more hatred toward Myra because she was a woman, I think it helped too that it was, you know, not helped, but you know what I mean? Because it was the 60s and still very rigid gender roles. It's like, you know, woman suspected. You, you're, sp you're expected to like grow up, have kids, you know, be yeah. a mother and everything like that. And she subverted that role by killing children rather than raising mm. them. And I think, I'm not saying that that wouldn't play the same now, but I think it was probably more, uh, you know, since, since gender roles were a lot more uh, concrete back then, maybe, or more rigid, I think uh, there was a lot more hatred toward her. But like I said, it, people hated her so much, every time she came up for release, there would be huge, like, riots, like, in the fucking store. Like, people would be out in the street saying, don't let her out, don't let her out, and they never did. I don't think gender roles had much to do with, much to do with it. You're looking at it from a modern sensibility. I think what it was is the sensibilities of the time was is that he was the bad guy, you were you were the good guy, you know what I mean, or the victim. You should have told people. That's yeah. basically they didn't realize. I don't think they realized that she was an offender. Yeah. Per se, that she was getting off on that. Yeah. I don't think well, I like, that I, but that does kind of relate to gender roles because I think that people didn't realize that women could get okay. off on that kind of fucked up shit okay. too. That's what I meant. Well, then maybe that's what you okay. Because, you know, and and like you said, we we were talking when we were talking about Fred and Rosemary West, and that was a little bit later. That was in the seventies, right. but I think that people didn't take some of their victims that escaped seriously at first because they're like, you know, if you had gone to somebody in the sixties or seventies and said there was a man and his wife. And they both raped me, and she was into it too. Like I think a lot of people would be weirded out by them and be like, the, "That the, sounds the, ridiculous," because the, they didn't think women the were West, like that. Could I don't be think like the that. Wests were quite as shocking, because when you looked at the West, you saw garbage. They were like white trash. They were garbage people. And they, when you well, at them. yeah, they they seemed, looked like they would do some bad shit. They seemed very like just these dim, yeah, trashy. Yeah, yeah. Kind yeah. of. This couple here actually looked kind of stylish. She had nice, cool fucking hair, and they were trying to dress up. They didn't look like, they didn't look like that. Dirt people. bags. They yeah. didn't look like dirt bags. I mean, they like, were, but they didn't yeah. look like. They didn't dirt look bags. like dirt bags. So, the they, West definitely did. Yeah, look like dirt the bags. West. You look at me, go, oh yeah, well of course. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't that surprising. Right. <laughs> All right. So, let's wrap up our valentine's day special hopefully we haven't bummed you out too much for valentine's day you still got two days you can like do some fun shit buy some chocolate get some roses have a drink do some shit even if you're by yourself <laughs> are you are you all right i uh, know i'm not doing good he's not doing not good, doing good no. Aww. well happy valentine's day to you right here i'm on my second this one. is this is my little baby right here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's a little oh see. happy valentine's oh, happy yeah. valentine's day see Word. Please don't ask me to kill any children. Ah. <laughs> I had to tie it back to the thing sometime. So anyway, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed our Valentine's Day special. Well, enjoyed is probably not the word, but you know. Uh, yeah, so if you like the show, remember, like, share, subscribe on all your social media. If you'd like to financially support the show, it would be greatly appreciated. You can go to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash 13 o'clock podcast. Or you can go to our blog, which is 13 o'clock podcast. I know, I can't take dot WordPress .com, And there's a link in the sidebar to a PayPal account if you'd like to give a one-time donation. Also, check out our last movie review, which was Big Man Japan. And <laughs> also, check out our Zazzle store. Uh, I promise I'm going to add some new shirts eventually. I just haven't got around to making them. I'm been busy, man. I'm going to make a KukulCon one like yeah, in, in honor of Tom here. And she's got to finish these audio books. I know. I really so. got to do that. That's like fucking... Oh, yeah, tomorrow's it? Monday. No, it's not. Tomorrow's Tuesday. <laughs> oh, is it Tuesday? Today's Monday? Well, sure the was, day we're sure recording was, sure this, course, we're yeah, recording yeah, this sure on was. a Monday. Okay. I'm not going to tell you what day it is, yeah, but we're recording it on a Monday. Yeah. You're watching it on a Tuesday, unless you're on Patreon, mm -hmm. in which case you are watching it on a Monday. It actually is a Monday. But yeah, so check out the Zazzle store, I promise. We have like a bunch of really cool shirts on there now and glasses and stuff, but I'm going to add some more in the future. And uh, that will do it for our Valentine's Day special episode 130. Oh, yeah. it, now I have to say Wait, something right shocking on. so you can whip the glasses off. Do Wait. it, do it, do it. Oh. <laughs> that was pretty awesome. I, I feel bad for everybody that's just like listening to the audio version and not seeing the video because they're missing out on this epic fucking shit right now. Yeah, they're not missing out on anything. Just <laughs> me and some 1950s glasses. <laughs> 
The I VA liked them a lot. Me, the VA gave me these glasses. Well, they didn't give them to you. Well, you like? Yeah, I asked for them. They gave them to me. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I get a pair, new pair of glasses every year. I know. You're, well, you're lucky, you know. Yeah. These are these are yours. Oh, are they? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I forgot. Because remember, this. I broke yeah. mine and you I could yours, and so. I couldn't afford to buy new ones, so yeah. I just stole your. Other couldn't ones. afford to buy new ones. We live in this big old house right here. You can't afford to buy new. Okay, go ahead and shut it down. I have time for this. <laughs> he doesn't have, I have time, time for this. this. I don't All right. Out of a bathroom. You Again? Here, you to call. Yeah, yeah. He is the world's smallest drinking. bladder. You guys. I'm a man. I got a. I got a bladder the size of a lime. <laughs> 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 so everybody have a happy valentine's day I'm trying to get out of here and we will see you next time mm -hmm. bye <laughs>